Peter, thank you very much for having us down. Do you know what? It's, it's blown my mind a little bit that I was looking back through your record and I was thinking like, it didn't feel like, it doesn't feel like it was yesterday when you had that 300 fight. Mm. And it was obviously on the front cover of Boxing News when I was there. You made the front cover of The Times and it's actually 13 years ago. Yeah, yeah, nearly uh, Halloween night, my last fight, 2008. Does it feel like that, that amount of time has passed? Um, no, it don't really. It doesn't seem that long ago, you know, but uh, it obviously was, but it seems like it's gone in the blur, really. And there were offers for a 301st fight? Yeah, there was, yeah, but... Good ones? Um, I had a few phone calls offering me fights, like there was a one in Dubai, but my wife and I, straight away, put a knocks on the head and said, no, you're not having 301, because OCD, I'd have to have 310 then, so... It was a good time to retire, 300, yeah. It's, a, well, a good time to retire. <laughs> there aren't many people that made that. No, there ain't, but like, look, I never set out to do 300 fights, that'd be ridiculous, but, and like I say, actually, when I got to 292 fights, I had more or less retired and packed it in, but then I went to a show in Scotland, Tony Anna was fighting for a Masters title, and um, I was on the top table with Tommy Gilmore as a guest and that, and Tommy happened to say, how many fights did you end up having? I said, 292. And he, he just said, I thought you would end up having 300 then. And he just planted the seed in my head and I just, that night, you know, I had a little thing about it, had a few drinks up there and I just decided I'd have eight more fights and just round it off to 300. It's an incredible story, incredible journey. Um, before we get to, I suppose, that final, or the final chapter there, as it were, um, what are you doing with yourself these days? Because you've made time for us after a day's work. Yeah, look, so I just work now, I've got job, I work for a removal company all around the country, doing different clearance buildings and things like that. I enjoy it, I work with some good lads and uh, have a good laugh, yeah. You've always done bits and bobs though, even though, even through your fighting days, you were painting, decorating, labouring. I've done a bit of everything, because like I said, I know a lot of people and I've done a bit of work here, a bit of work there, you know, so I was always busy here. What was your first boxing memory? Pro or amateur? Of, you know, in life, in uh, life, as a kid. My first amateur what? fight, um, I remember it really clear. Uh, I boxed a kid from Castlevale called Ray Petit. And then I beat him, I got best fight of the night. And then I had my second fight against a kid who was 5-0, and oh, who was heavier than me, and my opponent didn't turn up, so they asked me with the boxing, and I said, yeah. I lost on the majority decision team. The kid actually went on to get to the schoolboy finals, Lee Williams, his name was, good lad. And then I won my next 19 fights on the trot. Lost to uh, Nigel Wenton in the schoolboy semi-finals. Um, entered the junior IBAs, got to the quarters, couldn't make the weight. So I was out of that. And then um, I entered the NABCs when I was 15. And um, got to the finals there. And lost to Mark Tibbs in the final from Repton. And I didn't box amateur again. He's gone on to become a good trainer as well. He has, yeah, very good trainer. How did you lose to Mark? Points? Points, yeah. So, I Looks like... I never ever got stuck. Look, so I lost four times out of 54 fights as a double chair. I was really good. And um, the only person who ever gave me a standing count was Nigel Wenton. But I never never got poor over or nothing in any amateur fights. I was a really good amateur, actually, yeah. What did your parents make for you boxing? My dad loved it. But my dad was really you know, keen for me to box. Like, like I say, I'm from a big family. I'm the youngest of nine. And uh, my older brother done it, David. He had about 25 fights. He weren't too bad. But... Um, I was at a club called Talbot, not far from here, new club, and I was there for a few years until I was about 13. Then I moved to an Irish club, Ladywood ABC, the other side of the city, one of my friends boxed for him. And it was, a, it was a different kind of club to the club I was used to, because the club I was at before, it was like purely a boxing club with like hit not be hit, where Ladywood was more of a get stuck in and have a fight. And, and like Frank O'Sullivan who ran Birmingham City, always said to me like, he was a better boxer when he was at Talbot because I used to have more of a scrap when I was at Ladywood. It was that yeah. type of club, actually. Yeah, I boxed for Salisbury ABC, and same thing. It was a uh, it was a tough it was a tough environment where you had to go in. Pretty much, it was all all straight ahead. Yeah, that's what Ladywood was like. It was crash bang wall up a bit. Yeah. Um, so when you turned pro, then after after a successful amateur career, I guess your ambition you were quite ambitious. Well, no, because like I say, my last amateur fight was fifteen. And then I was in quite a bit of trouble for a few right. years and didn't get back into the boxing until I was 20. And 
there was a pub just down the bottom of the road here and um, Rocky Lawler used to be Midland Bantamweight champion, he was a good friend of mine. I was in the pub one night, talked to him, he said to me, do you want to come train and that? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he knocked my door the next day and he said, come on, are you ready? And I was like, what? He said, come on, we're going training. So I jumped in his car, got my stuff together, went over to the King Stanley where Nobby had the gym. It was an old derelict pub that was being good to get demolished. I just started going over there a couple of times a week and I just got the love back for boxing and started sparring again. That. And Nobby said to me, then five years out, you know, and I was in trouble and that, though, but he said it's kept me fresh, so, you know, because he said you might have been burnt out if you carried on doing your amateur, so. And it, I had to, not learn to box again, but I had to grow back into it, if you know what I mean. Sure. Mm. Yeah, that five-year spell, actually, obviously, it's in your book, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. Um, you actually went to prison? Yeah, a few times, yeah, when I was younger. Like I said, I was, uh, I was 15 when I first got uh, locked up. Were you, were you no good? Were you a bad person? Yeah, I basically was, yeah, I was always in trouble, I was out robbing, robbing cars, fighting, just burgling shops, anything like pubs. What um, was the longest time that you spent? I got two and a half years, but that was, that was for a, well, when I was 17, I, I was out of prison, and I was in a park not far from here, I'd done a run around a taxi, me and my mate, and I ended up having a fight in the park, and I got stabbed with a screwdriver and punched in my lung, and actually had the screwdriver hanging out of my side, and I pulled it out collapsed. My mate happened to drag me through a garden and then, uh, luckily enough when we were, he was banging the door I don't remember much about it. The woman happened to be a nurse and she got an ambulance for me and that and I was in um, Hartland's hospital for about six, seven weeks and um, had an operation and my family was quite shocked, especially my mum looks thought those kids were dying at the moment but I came through okay in the end. Were you touch and go for a bit? Well, I don't think I was on death's door but it was quite a Bad injury because I had a punch of lung. And like, when I got out of there, then like, I saw myself out early after about six weeks. I wanted me to stay in, but I was having none of it. And um, when I got out of there, then I, I couldn't really walk nowhere or run nowhere. I was really out of breath all the time. And then I got back in trouble again, and that's when I got two and a half years. And then I got out when I was 20, and I was more or less out three months, and I was pro boxing then. When did, so, did you make the active decision to change? Did you think, you know, I'm not going to get in any more trouble, that sentence was long enough? It, was, it wasn't really the sentence, it was my girlfriend who's now my wife, like, more or less giving me the old mate, like, you know, you either stop going to prison or basically I won't be with you, so it was an ultimate that works, I'm still with her now, so <laughs> <laughs> she's done something right for me, yeah. Yeah, big thing right yeah, for you, if it's down yeah. to her, then you owe her an awful lot. Oh, yeah, everything, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So what, what was the ambition then when you turned pro then, what were you, you know, Obviously, did you know where that, because I spoke to Arv Mitu about this, and he sort of said that he didn't really know where the land lay when he joined Nobby, and he didn't know what he was necessarily signing up for. Did you know what you were signing up for, or did you turn pro with the idea of thinking, I can maybe make it to British title level? Or? No, to start with, I just, I was enjoying the training again. I was loving the training. And it was just keeping me out of trouble, basically. And I, it weren't a bad thing and I was enjoying it, I was going to shows and that this before I was you know, I had any fights. So I was going to shows like I like watching the boxing again, I fell back in love with the boxing. And um I didn't think about it so like so my uh, my first fight I got a draw, I didn't even know what a draw was because I, I didn't I have been to a couple of pro shows like say, so, but I, I didn't know what a draw was when they lifted both the hands up. So I absolutely beat the kid up, do you know what I mean? And uh when they give it a draw, I've gone to me, what's that there? And he's gone, they've given it a draw, I've gone, what's that? He's gone, well, you haven't won and you haven't lost. I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. And he said, you can box that kid again next week. And I didn't really understand. He said, box him on one of the run shows next week. But the kid never boxed again, do you know what I mean? I retired him. <laughs> See, I bet you did retire a few, didn't you? Oh, I think so, yeah. Um, look, say, uh, I was just enjoying my boxing. And look, when I first started, I was getting some good results and that. And I was probably putting my head over a little bit, but... I was still competitive for that lot. I remember, I remember going down to um, down London's Mickey Duff show and I boxed Chris Clarkson, who was a central area champion and boxed some good lads. And it was a close fight, I thought I might have nicked it, but he got it. And it's what a lot of my fights was. I was getting close fights, I was going the other way, but I was always fighting away from home as well, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and it, it wasn't too long before you started to get matched against some very good fighters. Yeah. So the likes of Johnny Bradle and Duke McKenzie early on. Yeah, well, Nobby asked me about the Johnny Breville fight. Um, I think Des Gagano or someone like that went and boxed him. And um, he offered me the fight. I'd never been abroad in my life. And uh, 
said, do you want to go to Denmark for it? It's cute. I went, yeah. But Nobby pulled a master stroke over there. And I went, you don't do six two-minute rounds abroad. Well, when we was over there, it was supposed to be six threes. And I saw Nobby talk to the timekeeper and go to point who he's watching that. He was a class. I never understood what he was doing at the time. Point who he's watching that and doing not two to, I was thinking, you know. So, I'm thinking it's six three-minute rounds, but he's, he, at the end of the, it's six twos. I've come back to Nobby, I said, I thought it was six threes. He's gone, oh, no, don't worry, you'll be okay. I've done the six twos with him. It was an easy fight. It was quite easy. I, mean, I saw it on YouTube before and good fight, Johnny Bredwell, but I wasn't out of class or nothing. Never really had me in any trouble and that. And Nobby said, like, yeah, you've done okay there. He said, like, you passed through apprenticeship, basically. Do you know what I mean? And that's when he was matching me with, like, better kids, better kids than me, but I was holding my own with him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I still find it surreal now, obviously, even though I've been in boxing a long time, to hear a journeyman say a fight that they lose is an easy fight. Well, you can make it as hard or as easy as you can, do you know what I mean? Sometimes you go in there and you know, it's like up Scotland, I've boxed up Scotland numerous times, and you can either make it hard or easy, and like, you can have, go in there and have a battle and try and punch the head off him and try and win, which I have done loads of times, and not the decision, or I think, well, I'll just have a move about here. And, just make it like a spa and like, you just slow the pace, right? It's, it, it, only a journeyman can really tell you how to slow it down. Like me and Christian Light used to talk and he used to say, like, you know, you, you know, it's like, I mean, I took Christian into fight and uh, he knew exactly what I was saying to him because, like, so like, don't, you know, push him back to the corner, tie him up, have a walk around, just like speaking to myself, basically. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. he knew what he was doing, yeah. Who are some of the journeymen that you've admired over the years? Are there um, any that really stand out? Well, I think William Warbson was a very good journeyman. Yeah. <coughs> a lot better than his record. Sometimes too good for his own good. Too good for his own good, because sometimes he'd, he'd beat the kid. <laughs> Wouldn't get no work for it. Kevin McCauley, decent, knows his way around the ring, do you know what I mean? I mean, nearly 250 fights. Um, Curtis Gagano, like his dad, I mean, Des Gagano was a fantastic journeyman. I mean, I used to look up to Des when I was younger, around the shows. He used to always give me a bit of advice and, you know, always stuck in my head, you know. Is it a tough gig? It is tough because, like you say, me and my wife are tired. I've been training some days. I've come home, sat in the kitchen, eat my dinner, the phone's gone. There's a fight going. When? About two hours if you can get the Dudley or Wolverhampton. Or yeah, okay, yeah, right. Then. Is it definitely on? Well, give me 10 minutes, I'll ring you back. And they'll ring you back. Yeah, the fight's on. So you've been training or you've been to work and whatever, had your dinner, and then you go and fight. and. It's always stacked against you. The kid's heavier than me, the kid's bigger than me, the kid's fresh. He's been training for this fight for about three months where, you know, I've probably just come back from work or been training, sparring. And I've gone and done that numerous times. I've been in the house and Nobby's bibbed the horn. Because I always had my kit ready, always. I'd come home, my wife would wash my kit, rebag it, and Nobby's pulled up those, I'd bib the horn. You would get your kit, where we're going, London, fighting out, you know, just get in the car, go in the car, fought Marlon Ward, people like ABI champion. I can't say easy fights the way because I wasn't scared of them. And I, once I once I boxed people like Duke McKenzie, everything seemed like Dan Gray after there because he was so when I fought the Duke McKenzie fight, I wasn't a journeyman in mindset. I went down there and I was offered the fight with Dave's mouth. He said, I just fought Duke McKenzie, yeah, yeah, flyweight, small, you know, I'm a, I'm a featherweight, back to bands weight, got a rude awakening, do you know what I mean? But, I didn't do that bad for five rounds because I wasn't just covering up and all that, do you know what I mean? I was having a go, and but he was just, he was just too good for me, do you know what I mean? And then give me a bit of a mindset. Well, probably if I would have covered up more, and I, I, might, have, I might have figured more if I had done the distance, but... I'm yeah, good. so the Johnny Bradle fight told you that you could survive with these guys, but the Duke McKenzie one told you that you weren't on that level. Yeah, definitely, yeah, because like I said, Johnny Bradle, could be, what a competitive, I weren't going to beat him, obviously, he was a broad and that, and good kid, but I wasn't outclassed. I'm not saying Duke had class, but he, he was too good for me, do you know what I mean? He was just too good. I, and that's when I found different levels in boxing. I never got fought loads of European champions over the years, and I always done okay with them. It was just that world level was just that little stepping stone a bit too much, you know what I mean? There was that, just that little bit, bit too good for me. The European champions, I, I held me over a few. Well, Naz obviously went on to win a world title, and you fought Naz. You were first to go the distance yeah, one as well, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Tell me about that, the version of Naz that you got, and did you think that he was going to go on to achieve the stuff that he did? No, like I said, I used to see Naz, he used to come at a lot of the shows with Brendan all the time. Knew him, cheeky little play, you know, but, uh, but he was all right, I did, you know, I got on with him. But when I first boxed Naz, I mean, when I was off of the fight, I was like, I think he'd have five fights, six fights, all knockouts. I said, yeah, I'll fight him, no problem. 
and I uh, got there, it was at Everton, and um, he's coming to the ring, I got to the ring first, but I didn't get in the ring, I waited outside, and as he was coming doing his dance and all that to the ring, I just sat outside, turned my back to him, you know what I mean? I just looked over, he's got up. Oh, he got in the ring before me, I didn't get in until after he got in, but he didn't even flip in, he just stepped in, and I just got in then, and it wasn't a hard fight, like I say, it wasn't a hard fight, he was treading on my toes, I was treading back on his toes, he was, well, mind games really. Do you feel his power, or did he not get his shots off? He, he didn't really get his shots off, he didn't, he didn't hurt me, and in the second fight, like I say, when I was offered the second fight against him, I jumped it, it wasn't a problem, I was like, yeah, I love it, eight threes, it was in Cardiff, he was beating me, obviously, he, he was a bit better in the second fight than the first, but I weren't in no bother, and when the referee stopped the fight, I mean, you could see it. I was going mad because it was an unjustified stoppage, definitely. I mean, he would have beat me, 100%, but I always gone the distance with him. He never buzzed me on nothing, I could honestly say that. Did you have a few of those unjustified stoppages? Yeah, I did, yeah. I, I could only say I had about five stoppages that was genuine. Colin McMillan, that was a genuine one. Paul Lloyd was genuine. Freitas, genuine. Duke McKenzie, twice, but the second one when I bought Duke, I had a bad shoulder, but I went there for the money. I never used to read that, but I'd done it a couple of times. I bought some Mexican once, I um, can't remember his name, that he was on a showdown somewhere. He was a sparring part of someone. I took the fight uh, a few hours' notice. I'd been out on the bear and that. I'd been arguing, I went in the right front more. I just went down there, I needed a few quid. Done a couple of rounds and I said, no, I'll be hard, just pull me out. I'd, and Bradley, um, what's his name? Well, no, Bradley Price. Bradley Price. I boxed him on the Mike Tyson undercard. Easy fight. He was a lightweight then. When I boxed him up Scotland, I'd been in the car for six hours. Got there. He weighed in the day before and everything. So I said to me, um, I got out of the car. Basically, see the doctor, get bandaged, you're on first. I was like, oh, fuck you, I've nothing to eat. And, and then someone said to me, every year you know. I spoke to him and said, he's a lot heavier than you. He got in the ring and he looked twice the size of that when I boxed him on the uh, Tyson undercard. And I'll tell you, I just weren't feeling it, he hit me, first jab he hit me, put me square feet, you know, went straight on my arse, caught me with another shot, put me on my arse, then put me down in the referee's corner, but I wasn't really bothered that fight, so, out of the ten, I can only say five are really justified, look, Richard Everett stopped me, I boxed him three times, he was hitting me with a few good shots, didn't, he could punch, believe me he could punch, but he didn't have me out or I knew where I were, and, you know, didn't know where I was and that, but I didn't think that fight should have been stopped either. What was the most frustrating thing, being stopped or missing out on 30 days of No, money? being stopped, definitely, because I'd be, like I say, the two fights that, let's say three fights, like the one with Duke McKenzie, the second one when I pulled out, I went there for the money, basically, but being stopped hurt me more than the 28 days suspension, yeah, did you? What, pride? Pride, yeah, yeah. Because I prided myself on getting the decision. Not as, I'm a tough guy, but I, I knew how to fiddle my way around, and, you know, I did... People used to say to me, oh, you're tough, you are. I wasn't tough, I was clever, I know to break the reins down, that, do you know what I mean? Anyone can be tough, can't they? Do you know what I mean? Um, so when it came to training, because obviously you, I don't know, how, yeah, t t tell me about your training. Obviously you were active, so, or you were so active. You, were you like a Joey Giardello, a middleweight from the 60s, where you just fought so often that your fight was your training? Um, yeah and no, because I used to run every morning, every single morning, my tracks used to be at the end of the bed. Well, one pace, you do a 5k or... No, what, what depends what... If I had a middle and tall fight, I'd start off doing 10 mile runs, I'd break them down, then I used to I used to still go to the park over the back of mine where I've always used to run. I'd run the park, it's about a two mile thing, but I'd do it at a fast pace, and we had a big hill, I'd do 10 sprints, 10, you know, yeah. and I knew, how to, I, knew, I knew how to keep myself fit, and I was always in shape, that's why they phoned me up to do a 10 round fight or a day's notice on more than one occasion. I said, yeah, because I knew I could do the 10 rounds, because I knew I was fit. But I used to go to the gym, and well, I, used to, I never used to like doing the bags and that, like I'd skip in, and speedball and that. I used to like sparring, and I used to like doing pad work. That's all I used to read. Really like. I mean, people used to say, I bet you never spar because you fight. I used to say, you know, the officials at the box, I used to say, no, nah, I don't. But I used to love sparring. That's, that was my thing. I used to love having fight, like, you know, sparring against the lads in the gym, yeah. What kind of sparring partner were you then? Did you spar the way that you fought? Did you try no. and fiddle out or did you have No, that? no, no. I never I never sparred how I fought, no. I, I always had a quite, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, had a bit of a fight, yeah. So tell me about Freitas, Asselino Freitas, Brazilian who would obviously go on to become a world champ. Well, like I said, I used to know a lot of the boxers, yeah, look up, study a lot of the boxers. You were a big boxing news fan, weren't you? Yeah, big, yeah. Every, I mean, my missus, I used to have piles of them and all, you know what I mean? And when we moved, I left piles of them in the loft. But um, every Friday, 
straight around the news aisles, get my box of news on order. And I used to screw it up. That's when it used to be really good, you know what I mean? About all the shows, every, you know, describe every fight really, what weights, what record and that. And um, Nobby phoned me up and said, there's a fight going in, some Brazilian. Didn't know his name, Nobby didn't. So I went down to Liverpool. I was talking to Gary Fornell, who had boxed twice. Yeah. And Gary Fornell said to me, he boxed that Brazilian, I said, yeah, he went, he's big, mate. I said, oh, don't worry about it, you know what I mean? I didn't think nothing, I didn't even saw him. And then, I'm in the ring, and it's the only only time ever, as I've introduced me, I went to Nobby. That ain't him, is he? And he, went, <laughs> he went, yeah, I went, he's fucking big, he's, you know what I mean? And he went, hey, you'll be all right. Then he got in the ring, and he was fucking, he was big. Compared to me, I, I was a super bantamweight best, you know what I mean? I couldn't have bantamweight points. So. And then the slip ran out, his record, 18 points, 18 wins, 18 knockout. I looked at Nobby like that, and he went, hey, you'll be all right, son. <laughs> and uh, I went, okay, but look, look so he come out and he hit me with a left hook, I think to the body, and it weren't even that it really hurt, he just shook, took me off my feet, he was that big and strong, and I'd done three, three rounds with him, I think, and I weren't, he was like trying to move a house back, he was trying, trying, trying to push a car, I just weren't getting nowhere, and nobody said to me, I'm going to pull you out, so right. I didn't really complain, because he, he was just too big for me, do you know what I mean? You mentioned Gary Thornhill, what about him and your, your fights for him? I had some good fights with Gary, he, Gary was busy, he weren't really, he was very busy, and he was, I used to like kids like that because it was quite easy to read, if you know what I mean. I'd drive the box of a better kid than a crap kid because a correct kid, you know what punches are good? I mean, he was a good stand-up boxer, Gary, wasn't that? And um, you can read the shots off a good kid where a novice, you get caught with silly shots because they don't know what they're going to do, but a good, well-schooled fighter, you know, you can't know what shots they're going to pick. It's like when you fought, fought like Dean Piffy and Spencer Oliver, people like that. You knew there was going to come correct, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, mm. it's like a textbook. Like yeah, that. yeah. Spencer Oliver, good? Good, yeah, good. I mean, I saw Spencer a few weeks ago, we were having a chat, and um, he was saying to me, like, when we boxed, he said, when I eat you with that right hand, he said, I walked up, he said, I thought, you're out, man, you're out. He said, now I've turned around, I saw you getting up, I thought yourself, what oh, fucking hell. <laughs> and uh, I watched it not long ago, and like, you think the Fury one's good, I swear to God, you watch it, he hits me with a right hand, I drop on my back, arm spread, give me a little shake, and he, what, you see Spencer walking off, hands in the air, as he thought, this is over. And I just dragged myself back up, and we have a good fight for fight. It was only a four round, but it was a the play. It was like a world title fight in the then where Basil and elsewhere, wherever it was like. But, um, Spencer's career was obviously cut short. Is he one of the guys that you had marked off as a possible champ, possible yeah, world champ? Yeah, it was. A real, I mean, like I say, not many people done that to me. Dropped me like that, and for Spencer to do it, like I say, I don't know. How I got up for it, but I, I rated him. I said to him, I'll be after. I said he's good in places, and he was only saying to me not long ago, Spencer, when I saw him. That was his last fight at Super Antwerp, that he was killing himself to the weight. Then he was going to move up, and in all his he, he wished he would have moved up, but uh, he, he was, I reckon he would have gone to win a world title, yeah. Another one who was close to winning a world title but didn't quite get over the line was Michael Brody. Michael Brody, yeah. Good fight. I fought Brody, I think, twice as well. Another good fighter, but like I say, I like boxing kids like because like I say, there was textbook, and you knew there was going to one, two, left up, up, up come back, and... You, I knew what shots I was going to throw, basically, because it was good fighters, but he was really good, Michael, yeah. What was your lowest purse? Oh, my first fight, 180 pounds. 180 quid. You still remember that, now, right? gradually. Yeah, yeah cos, well, he was, and I'll be paid for all my uh, medicals and that. I never had to pay for my medicals and all that. Done all that, and then he took a little bit out. Don't forget, I was only fighting, I like, knocked up two bob dinner show and started. It's gradually started giving up a little bit more. As, as who, as well. who did you make your biggest purse against? I'd Not say, what was it? I'd say Hamid's second time. OK. Cos there was... They wanted, them, they wanted to, him to knock me out, didn't they? And his next fight, I think he fought for the European title, I think it was. Was uh, there good money in your 300th? Um, it was all right for, well, it was, yeah. yeah. It's also, I suppose the thing is with that 300, it's given you, a, it gave you a level of celebrity that you've been able to monetise to an extent with a book and Yeah, it looks like, like I'm, I had a book out. Look, say after my I don't know fought, if you would have got a book deal if you got 299 No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known. No, look, say after I had my 300 fights, then... I had quite, I mean, I had um, State Street Pictures in America get in touch with me. Got a message on Facebook, this is saying, so you want to chat? I thought it was a wind up to be honest. Do you know what I mean? I thought, oh, shut up, man. They've got, <laughs> they've got George uh, Tillman Jr. wants to speak. So I, I thought George Tillman, he made the biggest sports film and all that. So I said, he's my number, time to give me a ring. And he actually did give me a ring and I was speaking to him and that. And he was saying, I've read your story in the Washington Post and all this stuff. I was like, oh, yeah. He's going, yeah, he said, um, I'd love to make a film about it. And it went on for a few years, he said, that I was talking to script writers, they'd done the scripts and that, they sent them over here, I read them. 
I didn't like it. I didn't like it one bit. I said that isn't me. It was like really Americanized. I met my missus at a barn dance. I don't even never, never been in the barn. <laughs> and uh, I said I said this to them. I no, no. Well, it is. Um, we have to change certain bits and that. And I was like, oh, I said, well, I don't like it. And then they've done another script sent that over. And then there was just going about getting funding and all that. It went on for a few years and then it just faded out. But I still actually, the geezer at, um, called Mike Flavin, who was a producer for the company, he works for someone else now. He actually brought my book off me not long ago. He got in touch with me and okay. he said, I want to read your book, Pete. And he said, no, he sent me the money over that. And I sent it over to him. He, he messaged me the other week and he said, oh, great story, he said, do you know what I mean? So I wish they would have gone ahead with the film. So. I don't know why they've got to do that to the stories. That even, you know, with the films they've done, they've turned, you know, from, from real life stuff into the movies. Mm. All the stuff they've taken away is, they've taken away the, the sort of essence of a story. Even with someone like Mickey Wards and stuff, the stuff that they've created for Hollywood effect, they've taken out some of the best stuff. Yeah, to try exactly, and yeah, yeah. put in some false narrative. Uh, well, that's what it was like with this. It's like made out like, clocks I got stabbed when I was younger and that. They made out like it was, because <coughs> from an Irish family, they made out like it was a, like an English man who stabbed me and it was all, I said, no, no, it's just, don't sound right, no, it just didn't sound like we was an Irish family. Authentic, yeah, 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 it sounded like we was an Irish family, you know, picked on by an English family, it never happened, shit, man. Yeah. So when you, you said obviously, or we, we said that the Duke McKenzie fight sort of changed your mindset and that's when you sort of became a, a journeyman. Did that affect your confidence when you started to sort of settle for being in the blue corner? Um, I was in or all, out of the ring? Um, not out of the ring, it didn't, no, it didn't affect my confidence like that, but um, yeah, it's hard because you, you know, you know you're, look, when you go there, you're always two rounds down, it doesn't matter where, if you're a journeyman, and you, they don't expect you to win, and the referees, a lot of the referees, they look at you like, oh, it don't matter if you don't win because you're used to losing. I mean, there's plenty of fights up one, and I forgot the decision, and I've looked and I thought, how can you do that? But like, we see it time and time again, but yeah, like look, say you have to be thick skinned. If you start, I, I, I never used to slag the referees off. Nobby did, right? He used to give them a, the eye medical and all that, right? And I'd just be like. Pff. Yeah, for some for some fights, you probably started four rounds down with Nobby yeah, in the corner. Yeah, well, <laughs> referees have actually said to me, you would have got won that fight if he were in your corner. They have actually said to me, I mean, Mickey Van once said to me, I was boxing, uh, I boxed Sean Hughes, and I dropped Sean Hughes that. And, I won the fight, I thought, but coming out the last round, Mickey Van's got to me, good last round there, like, good last round there, Pete, yeah, draw. And I had a good last round, they give it a draw, but quite a few refs said that to me. They said, we're going to give you the win. They give me the draw, but then 12 draws on that day, 12 wins, because none of them have been in my hands, do you know what I mean? Have you ever done the stats with your record and gone through each fight and worked out what your actual record should have been if decisions and stoppages? No, but I know, it, I can say, 60 fights at, at least, I, I, I could say it's 60 at least, but I've lost by half a point. And I'm in the away corner. So, you know, against kids who... And I've gone in there and I've, I've had an official move about it. Even though trainers have gone to me, look, Pete, have a move about it. We'll give you a little, a few extra quid, you know what I mean? I've done it numerous times. Because I knew, one, I wasn't going to get the decision anyway. So I thought, I'll try and get a few quid out of these. And I haven't been out. It's like, it's like a paid spot to me, really. So... Some of the journeymen have got good stories about going on hostile territory into crowds when you're going into someone's home, you know, a, home a home kid's town and stuff. Have you ever that, faced... That was me all the time. Is that what it was like? Yeah, I mean... What was, what, is, are there any atmospheres that stand out where you thought, God, that, you know... I think, I want to say that Johnny Greaves was spat at and different things like that. Have you ever had... No, no I've never been spat No, to be honest, uh, I've been booed, obviously, you get booed and called up and prick and all that and all that when you're in the ring right but most of the time I've come out there a lot of people have been oh fair pat on the back actually fair play to you mate you're tough you push them all around things like that do you know what I mean I've never really had anyone come into my face and really threaten me or anything like that do you know what I mean Not, nothing like that no. have you seen the clip of Tony Booth from Merv Langdale like down in Southampton when he yeah. gets in with a bowler yeah, 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 does does shuffle, yeah. yeah. yeah it's fine, I covered so. that fight for Boxing News yeah. I was there that was crazy, but he was getting some real stick. They were mm. singing "You Fat Bastard." Yeah, I know there was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he uncorked this huge right hand. And I know it was just out, well, yeah. No, I've been. And, you know, and then you could have heard a pin drop. I've been. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've been boxing and people are like you fucking prick and that. And I've put me head out of the ring and I'm fuck off, you prick. You know, I mean, things like that. But nothing's ever really come about it, like where they've stepped in my face after the fight and nothing like that. Were you wary of being too good so that the phone stopped ringing? Sometimes, because like I say, I've had fights where I know I can win. And so I stopped uh, Matt Brown around. I mean, he went on to the British title twice. I stopped him. I didn't think I had a fight for about six weeks. 
Do you know what I mean? And they're like, why? I, 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 I've never understood that mentality. Just because you win one fight, that means you're going to win the next. Your, your confidence is what your confidence is anyway. It's like, sometimes you're going, you, you're really fancy and you still don't get the win, but I've gone into fights really fancy and been up for it. And I've had a good fight and I've lost by a point where I thought, oh, I thought I won that. But other times I've gone in there and I'm, like I said, I've been in the car six hours or five hours. Or, I mean, um, see his name, uh, oh, I can't think of his name now. He found me up to go over to Ireland one day. Uh, What's his name? He's Katie Taylor's manager. Brian Peters. Brian Peters. Found me up once and he's gone, uh, can you fight tomorrow? It's on a Friday. I said, when? He said, tomorrow. Like, uh, Dublin. I'm going, yeah, yeah, so I'll get you a plane ticket. So I went over on my own, but I've done that numerous times, like Scotland and places like that. Because I once went to Scotland and uh, on the train. I was on the train six hours, no signal on my phone. And I got off the train and then there was a message off Tommy going, well, sorry, Pete, the show's cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone to cash point, got some money out of the bank. Uh, got the train back. Tommy sent me down a few quid, looked after me. But um, so after that, I used to make him fly me up there. <laughs> Talking about a change of mindset, have you ever had one where you thought you were going to go and give the prospect a few rounds, but he's taken a liberty and you're like, dug your heels in and thought, no, we're having a fight now? Oh, yeah, I've done that. If you look, say, he was spent trolley over there when he dropped me. I got, I mean, he even said to me, I got up and he said, I thought you was out. He said, when I saw you get up, he said, I thought, fuck you now. And we actually went so to so. We had a, especially the fourth round, it was a great round. Yeah, I'll give him a. You know, I, I won't go into law down for no one really, Jay. Yeah. I still have my pride. Do you think, or do you see as many journeymen now around as when you were doing it in the 90s and the noughties? Or are you concerned with like the influx of people using Eastern Europeans mm. and Mexicans? Yeah, and like I say, yeah, there, there, weren't, there, weren't, there weren't that many imports when I was boxing. Like, you, had, you had a lot of good journeymen, quite a lot. You had the Smith brothers, Tough Keen, you know what I mean? Like Kevin McCauley was about. Paul Wesley, Brian Coleman, Tony Anna, Cole Taylor, the Ramsey brothers. You know, that's just from Birmingham, you know, we, from Nobby, you know, we had some great journey. I mean, Nobby could take, I mean, he saved plenty of show. We'd go down to Liverpool or Manchester, wherever. Nobby would have six on the bill. Six of us might lose on points. But I guarantee, you know, you don't, who wants six first round knockouts? It's no good. The crowd don't want to go and see six, you know, two hours of boxing. They want to see a couple of hours. So we always give them a good fight at that end, so they knew who was there. For the duration. Were you close to Nobby all the way through your career? Yeah, I've always yeah, I've, I've always gone with Nobby. Yeah. I did he teach you? Did he teach you tricks, fouls, everything? Taught me everything like that. Yeah, fouls, how to slip shots. I mean, Nobby. People think Nobby was just used to it, but Nobby, he, he had a good brain about him. He used to say to you sometimes, look, uh, as much as you can about getting hurt. Do you know what I mean? And don't. He, I used to hate coming out with my black eye. I used to, used to me if I come out. I didn't used to want to pick me talk in school with black eye. Not everyone knew I'd done boxing. Do you know what I mean? Just look at me like I'm a fug. But um, not been new loads. He, he taught me how to slip shots and that. I mean, I knew how to slip shots, but I'm only about not got the left hook, walk them back, hold them, hit me in the bollocks, turn them. You know, I, I, I did. You know, you learn it as you go along. You don't just didn't have my first fight and knew all that. It's like anything experience. You gain it, and um, not be. And he used to put me with Paul Wesley, the Ramsey brother, you know, people better and bigger than me, and I'd learn tricks off them, and they'd learn tricks off me. And I, I mean, I've said to him before, I learned loads of tricks off you, so I learned, I learned tricks off you as well, you know, we're in one way, mm -hmm. you know. It's, we, we all learn a little bit off each other, because we was all experienced fighters in our gym, we'd all box good kids, so we knew we were allowed to survive and fight. There were a lot of good amateurs in that gym as well. There was, yeah. You know, yeah. when you mentioned Mark and Paul and that, they were good Some amateur fighters, fighters as well. Yeah, yeah really good. Cole Taylor was a good amateur as well. Um, you mentioned the Smith brothers. Were you close to Billy and Ernie? I, I was more closer to Billy than I knew, I knew Ernie quite well. But Billy, when I had my trans loss, I took Billy in a few times to fight, you see. And I was really, really shocked because like, I took Billy in the week before. I took Billy quite a few times. We'd actually shared a room when I was fighting in Scotland on a few times. And I took Billy in, I think, the week before somewhere. And I was going to take him in on this the Saturday or something like that coming up. And Errol Johnson phoned me up and he's gone, um, have you heard what's happened to Billy? I know I thought he was going to say he's pulled out the fight, and when he told me what happened, oh, I was oh, I was really shocked. I was heartbroken for you know his family and that because he was a lovely kid, real nice kid. You know, he, I used to have such a laugh with him. Always had a smile on his face, and you just don't know what's behind some people, and you know it was really sad. Yeah, I think Billy and Ernie are two of the ones that stand out to me in terms of when I think about fighters who maybe have gone there expecting just to go through the motions and have a four threes or a, a six mm. threes. But someone's upset them, and they've actually stuck their heels in. Plenty of good kids. I'll be. Yeah. I think he beat Josh Wall once. I didn't take him in. I was there. And 
Josh Wells expected to be, but Billy went on a little run at one time. He, he got a good few wins, but he, he was a tough, tough kid and he could fight. You know what I mean? He could fight. Why Why do you think he did what he did? Was he, did he suffer with depression, mental health issues? Well, I can't personally say what he suffered with, but I know it affected him when his brother could be same. Suicide, the same yeah. thing. And I know it really affected him. Cause I know there was twins, but it was really, really close, do you know what I mean? So, You've, yeah. have, you, have you ever struggled with that kind of stuff? No, to be honest, I haven't. No, like, so I, I've had a, my wife's always been with me. She's always been there. No, I've got a good family network behind me. And the only time I really suffered with a bit of depression was when my mum died about five years ago. That was the only time I was very close to my mum. I used to see her every day. I used to do a lot for her. And I found my mum dead in the house. And that really, really shook me for it. I was in a dark place for a long time, but... You, you ain't got good people around you, you get ahead of it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course, time does help. Yeah, it does, yeah, time is a healer, yeah. Definitely. Um, you still in touch with Nobby now, by the way? Yeah, I speak to him every day and again, but Nobby's very, <laughs> he's always been the same, like, it's like when he used to phone up for a fight, there's a fight going, blah, blah, do you want to but boom, that's how he speaks, Nobby, really quick, he phone me up, how, how's you, how's family, how's kids, blah, 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 that, okay, I'll speak to you soon, like, we'll go out for tweet soon, and every now and again, he'll pop over, and we'll go out for sweet tweet, no, I won't see him for a few months, but he always phones me up and he's never on the phone for longer than 30 seconds, my wife can tell you that. Were you a star student, do you think? Well, I'd like to think I was, yeah, because <laughs> he used to say to everyone in the gym, like more than that, we used to have a board in our gym and then no, there used to be names on there, he was fighting. My name was constantly on it. And then what do you say? Oh, no, but how come his name's always on the board? He said, because he never says no to a fight, because I never, I never used to say no. So he used to say to me, like sometimes someone would turn the fight down and he'd phone me up and say, do you want this fight? I'd say, yeah, yeah, sound. he said, do you want to know who it's against? I'd say, well, if so and so was fighting, I can fight him. Go on, he said, yeah. So in the gym one day, whoever turned the fight down, I'd be like, you had a good fight the other night, Pete, were you? Did you have a fight? Was it a spa? I can't remember. And just wine it in it. And I'd love to think I had a special place, but I think all the Dobby's boxes had a little special place in, you know, I think he treated us all a little bit different, but all the same in a different, if you like, you get what I'm saying. You know did I mean? you dislike the Losers Limited tag? Yeah, I did, yeah, I didn't like it. I did. When, not being very tongue in cheek, you say, and when he was on about this Losers Limited, I was like, no, nah, I'd say we should be called something like Warriors Gym or something like that. And he was like, nah, fuck him, because Nobby was like, fuck the system kind of thing, Nobby. You, know, you told Nobby to say, Yes, he'd say no. You know, that's how he was. Yeah, he, yeah. You know what he was like at the show. He, I mean, we used to jump in on the scales and he'd lift us up, you know, our little advantages. And sometimes they'd copy him and he'd say, but he's only took the fight tonight. How can you moan about three pounds? He's, took, he's been training for six months. Oh, and Nobby used to always say to the kids, like, that's why he used to make me laugh. The kid would come to the corner, you know, the centre of the ring, and Nobby would say, God, you look fit, son. You look fit. You've been training hard. He'd say, and he'd say to me, like, I'm all about you with him, just like, he, he, and I was like <laughs> but all he knew, like, other kids are like, probably like, you know, it's like when we used to be doing the pads, they'd be bang the pads, and you'd throw one over at the, the other side of the change room, and you'd go, fuck, you know, you're eating that hard, it's not a pit, I hope you don't eat that hard, and, that. and he was just, he was just the character that I'd be, you know what I mean? But you had to, you had to know how to take him. Is it a lonely life being a journeyman? Because um, you're in the blue corner, you're obviously out there on your own, but also you do have, like, this network where you've got Nobby and you've got the other guys in the gym, so there's a bit of a team as well, and obviously you mentioned you, your missus here and you've had mm. work and stuff. But do you know what I mean? Get at when I say it's like a lone. It's a lo it, f it feels like it's a lonely gig from the outside yeah, it, looking in. It can be, especially like, like so I used to get to quite a few fights on my own. Nobby was, he'd say to me, um, "There's a fight going on Saturday, but I'm in Scotland." Yeah, I guess he spread himself quite yeah, thin, having the boys yeah. everywhere sometimes. And, but with me, you say to me, "You know, I weren't really that." But like, I'd fly over to Ireland on my own, and I'd say to someone, "You take me in, I'll give you fifty quid." I wasn't really scared. I could be lonely there when you sit in the hotel room and so I'd be there till Monday on my own. But what I'd end up doing, I'd, like, especially when I was in Dublin, like, I'd go out to the town centre, I'd end up having a drink, I'd always meet someone there. And, and, but when you're sitting in these hotels of Scotland or Liverpool on your own, that and it can be a bit lonely, yeah, you're just watching the telly, but pff, it's just working. Did you spar some good boys? Um, I, nev I never liked sparring. I've done one... Paul Lloyd once, um, who actually stopped me in the pros with body shots and that. And um, I'd been training one night and he was training in Birmingham with the Lynch brothers. And they said, um, the phone up and said, Peter, I want to do a few rounds, give him a few quid, blah, blah. I went down there and he, he cracked one of my ribs, do you know what I mean? I thought it was just going to be a spar. He went on the sound on me and 
he cracked my rib, and uh, I thought, I think you're about 80 quid, I thought, I ain't doing that again. <laughs> oh, no, that, that's not enough, because it affected me for about a month, probably longer, do you know what I mean? And uh, I thought, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And I was like, offered, like, trying to go inspire with people, like Billy Arley, Col Col Tyler used to go down to um, Sunderland, places like Sparring and London with Duke McKenzie and that. And when Nobby used to offer, offer me, I was saying, no, I'm not. I weren't being beat up for peanuts, do you know what I mean? Yeah, putting more miles on the yeah, cross for less money. Yeah, exactly. Because all them hard sparring sessions, to catch up with you. I mean, I used to have good spars in my gym with my dad, you know, my mates basically. And we used to have a little row in that. But um, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't fancy being paid for sparring by Were you hoping they were going to do a journeyman prize fighter? I weren't bothered because uh, I'd retired by then. But um, if they had, I wouldn't just, I don't think, I don't think it would have really took off myself because what would they achieve? On the do you reckon the prize? Do you reckon the Jamie would have had a go? Oh, they definitely would have had a go against each other. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, but what would it elevate them to? They wouldn't have got a British torch shot or nothing like that. So, would have just been known as what the best journeyman. But would they have been the best journeyman because they, they had the best fight in the night? I don't know. They, I, the only way would have given, given them a good night though, wouldn't it? It would have given them a good wage probably and yeah. uh, an even playing field. Do you know what I mean? That's the only good thing about it. But I don't know. Would I fancy it? Probably, yeah. I don't know. You said you hadn't turned anyone down. It had to be someone that you said no to, whether you had the flu, whether you were injured, no. whether you whether you were like, I don't want to do that one tomorrow. It had to be something somewhere where you'd be like, no. Nah. <laughs> the only time I didn't fight, I was supposed to fight, uh, what's his name? I fought him eventually. Lebby Lebwana, or whatever his name is, the South African died. Oh, okay, yeah. Lebwana, yeah. yeah. I was supposed to box him once up Scotland, and I was in... Birmingham City Centre, uh, I come out of the phone box and uh, some kids tried to mug me, my leather jacket, and I ended up having a fight and I bust my hand up and um, I jumped on the fucking the bus in town and I come back home and I was back home and my missus like, I thought he was going to Scotland and I like, showed me hand and she looked like, you know, I phoned that I'd be up and said, like, someone's tried to mug me in town, but I'm, I never saw, I boxed with the flu, I boxed with colds, I boxed after I'd been on the night on the piece, I boxed the morning after I'd been on the night on the piece and I, I never said no, no. Never. That's what I can honestly say. Is there a fight that stands out where you're absolutely hanging, whether you were hungover or ill, and you're like, oh, God. I've done that a few times, yeah, to be, be fair. I mean, a box once. Has anyone winch about you stinking of booze? Well, <laughs> one, one Saturday, I'd, I, went, I, I went to the bookies just down the road, this round there, and um, I come out of the bookies, I met a few mates, there's a pub right next to me, I'm going to come in for a drink, and I'm going to have had a few drinks and that. And I had an argument with my brother's mate and that, and in the dig and that. And uh, I come home and I fucking had a few more drinks, so I was fucking went to sleep. And Andy Mayers phoned me in the morning. I completely forgot about this fight. Because what it was, Oli, uh, Oliver Harrison said to me a few weeks before I was in Ireland, <coughs> and he said to me, I've got this kid, he's green as grass, Pete. Will you come and have a move about him? I'll give you an extra couple of quid. He said, he sells a load of tickets. I said, yeah, right. I completely forgot I was fighting the kids. So Andy Myers phoned me on the Sunday morning about 10, 11 o'clock. I was in bed, hanging. He phoned me, he's gone, Pete, I'll pick you up. I said, what are you on about? He said, do you want fighting that show in Manchester or something? I went, mean, today? He's gone, yeah, I went, oh, fucking hell. And so I'm hanging, mate. He's gone, oh. he said, I said, but the kids ain't here, love. He said, anyway, so he picked me up, I've got in the car, he went, fucking hell, man, you stink a drink. I brushed my teeth, gargle wash and everything. And I honestly don't know how to blast the dogs because I was fucking, I was angry. And look, I was, Oliver said to me, just have a move out, Pete, move out, you know, I'll go all right. The first round, I've hit the kid with the left hook, and he's only got, and he's like, and Oliver's like, Peter, Peter, <laughs> <laughs> Peter, and I'm like, all right, all right, and uh, I, the kid beat me, but he, the kid shouldn't have beat me anyway, because I was really, really holding back, and look, the kid was crap, I, I can't remember his name, but but I was hanging, but uh, I've had a few, where well, I've been on the piece, and look, look so I've had a last minute call, and look, Oh, I've been out last night, that. I'm like, what's the money like? He's like, so, so, like, all right, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, just have a few drinks of tea and I'm all right. Do you wonder what would have happened if you got the breaks? Have you ever, do you ever allow yourself to think how how things could have gone? Yeah, because look, so I, I was, look, I watched a fight not long ago, so I was sent, people keep coming up with fights that I've never even saw of lately. When I watched Francis Benichou, and he was a former world champion, European champion. And I watched the fight with the sound like down that, and he just about beat me. He didn't really even, 
he, he, I remember him saying to me after the fight, I couldn't hit you, I couldn't hit you. So I didn't think he was very, oh, I could see it. And by the way, it was like, you put a stamp on it, and I, well, you know, I was slipping here, slipping there, cross guard and that. And I thought, I could have competed at that level. I'm not saying I would have won that, but if I would have been put into a European title fight, I wouldn't have disgraced myself, do you know what I mean? I'm not saying the world title fight, but like I boxed um, Harold Gear in Austria for a WBA Intercontinental bad boy, right? And I had 10 weeks training, and that's the longest I've ever had for a fight, ever. I was supposed to be an eight stone 10, I weighed it at eight stone seven and a half, I mean, my wife was telling me, I looked up, I thought it looked great, you know what I mean, because I was steam and stomach muscles and everything. And it was a 12 round fight, my first 12 round fight, really trained, no bear, no fags, nothing, you know, proper, I thought this boy, yeah, this is what I can do here. And I dropped him in the north, it was competitive fight all the way through, but the north round, I dropped him with a left up to the back, left up to the end, out. The referees, walk, give him a count, walked him back to his corner, wiped his gloves, walked me back to the corner, wiped up, I was thinking, what's he doing, what's he doing? And I actually battered him the last three rounds, really beat him up, and everyone was saying to me, after, I, I didn't win the fight, but it worked. Scorecards were a bit wide there, but it was a lot closer. And he fought for a world title after that, and he got knocked out in 17 seconds, one of the quickest knockouts. And like I've said before, I'm not saying I would have beat the geezer, but I know, even if I would have got stopped, I would have got knocked out in 17 seconds. So for him to justify fight for a world title, I could have fought for a world title and got knocked out, in, say at the end of the first round, I'm not saying I would have, but you know, it just proves that. Yeah. Like Johnny Brendel, he went on to be world champion. Quite a lot of people who, like Johnny Armour and that, that you know, I'm not saying that I could have beat him, but, but I could have been competitive for 12 rounds with the right amount of notice. And also, do you think if you'd had a backer, manager, promoter, do you think you would have had to have gone that way with yeah, well, someone else? Yeah, well, look, say, if I would have gone back amateur when I got out of prison there, and look, say, I was a good amateur, after, if, you know, I might, have, I might have won the ABA at all, then I would have got spotted by a promoter and signed up then, so, who knows? And then I would have been in the red corner, I would have been fighting the journeyman, and your confidence is different then when you're, you know, you've got the right trainer behind you, the, not saying the right trainer, but like the right backing and pushing you to, the, to that goal that they want you to reach, you know what I mean? Or instead of just getting there have a move about, or, you know, looks like I won two Midland titles, you know, proud of that, I won two Midland titles. Fought for a Masters title or a day's notice against Cole Greaves, you know what I mean? Give him a good fight, beat me, but not, not by much. If I would have had like six, seven weeks training, you know, who says, you know, notice, who says I couldn't have beat him? He went on to fight for the British title and that. So, you know, I know I was definitely good enough for that level. Going back to what we were talking about in terms of prospects now fighting a lot of imports and that kind of stuff, do you think in some ways that's stunting some of their developments and by not getting the rounds with people like you and William Warburton and Christian Lay and stuff? Well, 100% because, like, they start believing their own hype, don't they? They think, well, they've had six fights, six knockouts, but you check the geese record out. The one, you, English journeymen are the best journeymen in the world in my mind. These foreigners that... You know, we we made the tough stuff, you know, so and we've got pride, so they've knocked six kids out, six foreigners, Bulgarians, whatever. And then the the fight's one who's even half decent. And when they get hit back there, it's shock to the system because they're not used to getting hit. And it's a big shock to them. Like, God, he's just hit me back and he's hurt me. And they, they don't know how to cope and you see you see quite a few times once that happens to him. You, you can see these kids are always boxing. Every now and again I'll hurt them with a shot and because I could punch a bit, you know what I mean? I won't you know, I put quite a few people over and had a few stoppages on my record, but I could punch quite good. And uh, once you get stop stopping in the tracks of that, it's, that's how they learn. They start learning because then they think, oh, I got caught there with a shot. So they start readdressing there. The the box that the top. Like Dean Piffy when I boxed Dean Piffy, I think he done about five fights, one or more. And he come in, tried to bulldoze me, and I hit him with an uppercut, and I split all his mouth. And he looked at me as if thought, that shouldn't be happening to me. I'm I'm ABA champion. What what you do? You're a journeyman, but like. There's levels of journeyman. Oh, no, it's a good journeyman, you know what I mean? What does the term journeyman mean to you? To me, it can mean a few things, but I think someone that knows the game, knows the role more than anything, because we know we're not there to win, but we're there to give them a bit of an education. And if we can win, sometimes, you know, I've you know, pulled out the odd good win and that, and you, you don't just go in there and cover it. Like, like I said before, anyone can go in there and cover up and be tough, but you don't, you're not learning of this one, it's like working a heavy bag, isn't it? So, a good journeyman will show you tricks like eat you on the blind spot and have a walk around. I mean, I used to break the reins down, brilliant, I don't, you don't fight for three minutes, you fight for a minute there and then have a walk around, and when they come, time up, walk them up. And when you're walking off and that, I mean, I used to be able to slow the pace right down, a kid come out 100 miles an hour, I'd just stand there looking like, 
I just move my foot from there to there to there to there. And they look at me like, and they're bouncing that side, that side. All I'm doing, I'm losing, leaving, you know, a little bit of energy here, just move my foot there. I'm, I'm using their energy, I just move my foot there, there, there. And they're bouncing around. And after a few rounds, the fucking knackered, you know, yeah, yeah. And that's when you start putting a little bit back on them. And then, like, that's how they learn then when it's like, um, when they're getting frustrated and that, do you know what I mean? Who, who said it before about the, um, can't remember who it was. He said there was fighting someone, and after the box mate, uh, Barry Jones, he said, when he boxed me, he said he was frustrated. He said, but when he boxed that, uh, Del Jaffe or something like that, I can't think, the, the uh, French belt, he beat okay. Dean Piffy, you know, he said, when he boxed him, and he said, I didn't get as frustrated. He said, but I'd learned that from being frustrated boxing you. He said, because I couldn't get my shots off on you. He said, so when I boxed him, I didn't get frustrated, he said, because I've been in that situation before, so he had obviously learned that off me. He told me that himself, do you know what I mean? So he'd learned it from me. Does it bother you that the general public doesn't understand what a journeyman does? A bit, yeah, because you, you get your casual boxing fans. I mean, I know people who die hard boxing fans and they know what a journeyman is, and they, you know, they, they don't look more records, oh, you've lost that many fights, but they know the calibre of people have fought. But the average person in the pub, no, they haven't got a clue. Like, it's just ignorance. It's like I don't really know about football, but you know, it's, uh, it's vice versa. When you were on the cover of the Times, it should have been in many ways a career high, but it was trashy in the end, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was derogatory, and like they didn't. And I don't. I, f I felt for Ron Lewis, who I think wrote the piece, because I think the piece was was a normal boxing piece. Yeah, yeah. But obviously the headlines. Yeah. Said, what was it? Did it say like world's worst boxer? Something, something? something along them lines, but. Uh, what did you think when you first picked that up or you I first was a crock of shit, man, because I thought, man, you don't get to 300 fights and the people... If I was... I would have been packed in a long time ago if I was the worst boxer. You don't box the people up, the calibre of people I box. And if I was getting knocked out every week, every week, every fight, every fight, uh, say I had 200 losses, 180 of them losses have been knocked okay, then yeah, fucking hell, mate, you should have knocked you a long time ago, sure. but it weren't like that, but they don't really mean nothing to me, they've told people, it's just... Tomorrow's cheap, uh, cheap paper, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Were you happy with the boxing news? Yeah, I, I thought that was great, right? Yeah, because <laughs> it, it was a it was a compliment from boxing people, you know, people peers, who, your peers, peers yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, that's the word, yeah. And they, that's what I mean. People who know boxing, like people speak to me who know boxing, that like, well, what you've done, Pete, fucking amazing. I mean, people who read my book have gone like, you know, the, it's given me insight. People who don't really know about boxing, it's given me an insight to what I actually done. And they've actually messaged me people who know me from around here and other people, you know, wherever. And they've gone, God, what you've done, I found amazing how you, you boxed him out of day. And so it's, and they start to understand why you've lost them fights because they don't know that I've only took the fight at three hours notice and this keep you trained three months. They don't know that. All they see is result, lost points. They, yeah. don't, they don't know the background or anything. So now, while reading the book, some people do, obviously, but some people who grant, but they don't bother me. And you have ended up with plenty of awards, whether it's belts or services to boxing things and different things like that. There's been plenty of awards down the line. Yeah. I can't see anything in the house. Um, I've got one in there, the, them little jugs up there and that. But okay. a lot of my stuff, like, because uh, it used to be at my mum's, you saw, everything I've won, it yeah. used to be at my mum's house, you see. And now it's basically it's in the loft, if you know Is what I mean. Is it boxed yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. But um, looks like I've won some great awards, services to boxing. I mean, the Joe Bromley Award, what I mean. When I won that... That was through the Border Control Awards. Yeah, yeah. and like, when I won that, I was really... I mean, I mean, I can't present me that, I think, and I was really... I, I just thought I was going there for a dinner with Nobby, and when I won that, because I, I read the list, and I knew what it was about, the Joe Bromley Award, and when I won that, that's on me. I, like, to me, that was a real, real honour, because that's from boxing people saying, you know, you deserve this award, and that's, when we look at the people who have won it, it's, I mean, not everyone wins that, and you know, no. that's, I'm, I'm in history for that, yeah, forever. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, before, in terms of in terms of your skill level, you you were saying obviously you think you could have fought, you know, not for necessarily a world title, but against yeah. a world level guy. What what do you think could have been your ceiling? What in terms of fights that you could have won, British title? Do you think you could I have won? I, a British I think title? I could have won a British title. Yeah, if I had been, I don't like to say this, but managed the right way. If I had been steered the right way, I could have fought fought and probably won a British title. Okay, it's the right opponent. It's right, the right yeah. with, with everything on your side, yeah, yeah, as opposed yeah. to we, everything against yeah, you. Exactly, against me. Probably fought for European title. Looks like I fought plenty of European champions. I mean, I fought the one who beat um, Spencer Oliver, you know, I boxed him. I boxed a few former European champions. 
and I've done okay. There was, I've never had class. And you're talking, I'm taking these fights at short notice as well, you know. Might have had a week for some of them, five days. Never had longer than a week for any of them, or, you know. But like. Was I, the average five to seven days? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes less. But like I say, I boxed Paul Ingle just after I won my Midland title, and uh, I was fit. And I, I give Paul a really good fight. I think he had been by a point, two points, you know. Yeah, good fight. I didn't work, yeah, but I was competitive the whole way. Sure. But the second time I boxed him, I had the flu, that's what I'm saying. I boxed it, had the flu, and they found me up. And for three rounds, he absolutely fucking battered me. I thought, oh, God, come on now. And then he must have fought, but I actually spoke to him after. And then he slowed down. But I say slowed down. Paul Ingle never really slowed down, did he? Because he was, but he was put, picking his shots a bit better, as he thought, well, I'm getting the distance now. And he went the distance, and I think it was at York Hall. No, yeah, it might have been York Hall, the boxing. But, and I was in the bar, actually, after. And he said to me, oh, I thought I was going to fucking stop you tonight. I said, Paul, you don't know how close she was, man. I said, I was fucked, man, after three rounds. I said, I've been flued up in that. Brought him a pint, whatever, we had a chat that he went, what was it? I said, you need a deal, so I'm glad. He took, took your foot off the gas a bit. He said, oh, fuck me, if I would have knew that one, because <laughs> the steam rolled you know, Is there a difference between going to a fight, losing a fight, going through the motions, expecting to lose, and throwing a fight? Yeah, I've never... I wouldn't say I've threw a fight. I've gone in there and I'd... Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do, yeah. Because yeah. I'm trying to... I'm just trying to... I'm not, not trying to drop you in it. Yeah. But I know when I put this out, when I said originally when we were going to do this interview many, many moons ago, I put out some questions and someone said, have you ever thrown a fight? I'm like, well, I'm sure you haven't ever thrown a fight. I'm not but thrown obviously a fight. Obviously, there's, there's kind of like an agreement, isn't there? Yeah, that's the way it is, an agreement. It's like, the kid... The, the, this is what I always say. The kid who you're boxing don't know about this agreement. You don't know about it. the kid who you fight. You don't know that you're gonna have a move about. It. He don't know nothing about it. His trainer knows about it, or his manager knows about it. They've said to me, "Loads like, hey, we you coming up? You know, have a move about this kid tonight. You know, it's green as grass. Sells loads of tickets, like, but we just, you know, we want to see what he's like. Need some well. rounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. need some rounds. Yeah. Uh, so you ain't gone in there and threw a fight, but you've gone in there and done oh, just have a little spar here. Yeah. And they're probably not gonna get decision anyway. Yeah, you know, the kid might be half all right anyway. So, but no, I've never different. Definitely, I've thrown a fight. I've gone in there and had a move about, but I've never like thrown a fight and say, like, fall over and this and that, like that. No. Yeah, yeah, go down in the yeah. second. Yeah, yeah, go down in the second, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I actually ask Arv, and I'd be interested to know your thoughts, is when I talk about uh, boxing and damage through boxing and talk about long term stuff and whether what, what now we call CT, but we used to be punch drunk and everything yeah. like that, A, do you have any concerns about that kind of stuff? Do you have myself? Yeah, nah, yeah. not one bit, not one bit whatsoever. Like I say, um, because you seem sharp as a tank. I am sharper. A lot of people, uh, people I work with, people I meet, they can't believe I had 300 fights. And I can't sometimes, because I, <laughs> I can remember, like I, say, I can remember my amateur shop fights, I can remember fights I had at school when I was a kid. It's like when I read, read this book, I've had more sisters ring me up and that side. So they forgot about things what I've done as a yeah, kid, yeah. and they've got, I remember that. You've got a great memory, I really have. I've got. I mean, I can how's your short-term memory? Is that as good? Y yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah look, say it's like uh, I don't forget nothing. I'm not to tell you that, <laughs> but uh, I don't forget nothing. And uh, look, say before my last fight, all my medicals was up, and um, a week before I had my brain scan done, you know, MRI, all that. Everything came. It, I've never had one movement in all my brain scans in, in like, all the years. Never had one. So as soon as I would have had one, I would have packed it in straight away because my health would be everything. Even if I would have had one movement, one query, I would never have boxed again. But I never had one. So I went into my last fight, knowing the kid was nothing, and he wore the punch and nothing like that. I drew with him a few weeks before when I beat him. And I knew he weren't going to hurt me. I come out of the fight and no, not one bit of damage on me now. When you were, say, 170 fights deep into your career, mm. what was motivating you to keep doing it? Was it just that habit? It's just the life that you were living? It was habit, but I, did, I love fight. I did love fighting, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I enjoyed did you it. Get yeah. the, did you get pre-fight nerves and butterflies and that, or did they go through experience? Um, or did, like, if you went to a big, a big fight or you had a big arena fight, would you be like, wow, this has got the juices flowing, or was it the same regardless? It was just it, another day at the office. Um, yeah, no, because if I was boxing a real good kid, I'd, have, I'd be switched on. I'd be a little bit, a bit nervous, like what you should be. It's like I said before, I box. Um, John Kay's, I think first or second fight, whatever. I wasn't one bit nervous, right? I'm not one bit nervous, I was a kid having his first fight. 
big mistakes. He moved right in the first round. He did sort me fucking head off. I was like, and then that's, I, I thought, pff, taking the piss out. I wasn't switched on, and then I switched on, and then I was okay. I didn't respect him as much as I should have, but that one punch made me respect him quicker, where, you know, you, if I, like say, if I was boxing the kid, like we love box Spencer Oliver, I knew he was a good kid, so I was switched on, do you know what I mean? And I think that's what made me get up from that punch as well, because my adrenaline was still kicking in, and I was a little bit nervous and that. Like when I boxed on, on big shows, and when you box on a big show, you know you're boxing a good kid. You know, on these little dinner shows and that, it's just a normal ticket seller, he's a normal kid, he ain't really going nowhere, he might fight for an area at all, but when you're fighting these prospects who are Frank Warrens and, like, you know, Barry Hearn or whatever, yeah. you, know, you know he's going to be a good kid because he boxed for England, he's won Commonwealth Games, all that. So that nervous, being, by being nervous, it makes you sharp. So, yeah, but I was never, I was never really that nervous of a normal kid, if you know what I mean. Did you ever think that you were sort of, did you, so did you think in terms of you being a journeyman and experienced, did you think that you were sort of in on, in on the show or did sometimes it feel like you were being thrown to the walls? I thought I was always thrown to the walls, really, in a way, because that was, that was what my role, that's what it's like with a, like I said, with a box bench, Oliver. They, every, once I, I went the distance with Naz, everyone wanted a better Naz. We could stop Naz. If we could stop Peter Buckley, Naz hasn't done it. You know, it was a, and I knew that when I was boxing certain kids, I knew they all wanted a, because it's like, Nazim couldn't do it, but he done it, so he's got to be a better fighter than Naz, but it don't work out like does it? <clears throat> In terms of being thrown to the walls, though, like it was it? Did you and and just, we're looking at pre-fight nerves here as well. Was it a daunting thing to go to these occasions? And know you're fighting the establishment, judges, the crowd, sometimes many tens of thousands, uh, and a young, hungry prospect as well. Did, like the, it's just not in your favour, is it? No. But but did you feel like? Did you feel a bit like a, it stiffened your resolve? It was you against everyone in the building. Yeah, well, it was my stubbornness that made me get through the fight as well. A lot of it. I thought all these fucking booing me and shouting. I'll show these. Days. The, this kid's been training for three months, day in day out. I've had this phone call two days ago. I was on the bear last week. The crowd's all booing at me. I know the refs against me. It, and it was my stubbornness a lot of the time that kept me in there. I thought you ain't all having a laugh at me. You ain't fucking. You ain't all laughing at me on the floor, man. You know what I mean? And you're walking out going, ha ha, you got fucking knocked out, mate. That was a lot of the, that was a lot of my mentality a lot of the time. It's like, a boxer kid called Martin O'Malley in Ireland, real late nose job, American kid, Irish American kid, supposed to be in the bollocks and that. And I went over there, and the referee didn't know me over there. The kid was beating me, but he wasn't hitting me with any shots that was hurting me, or he was just busy, 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 you know what I mean? But it wasn't hurting me, I was slipping a lot. But the referee didn't know me. Didn't know what was capable of. The kid was not man. The next thing, the ref jumped in. I'm like, what the fuck. And I, but like I say, when I was boxing at certain shows and the crowd's all there, the refs on the kid's side, you got the promoter. And the, I wouldn't let them have the last laugh. And I was thinking, you mean because oh, you're gonna fuck it with the rear back out. So I mean, you're, like, ah, you're gonna get fucking knocked out. I think, mate, you don't know me. I ain't getting knocked out in front by no one. No. Especially the kid who's had five fights, five wins, all on points. He ain't knocking me out, no chance. This is where I was going when I was talking about damage in the book, by the way, is when I've, so I've been uh, on some podcasts as a guest in, in America recently and they were, talk, and they were talking about fighters who've suffered damage and generally we were talking about some of the higher profile, pro, higher profile casualties and guys that deteriorated over time later on, like a Leon Spinks and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, and those guys were saying, oh, well, in your country, you've got guys that have lost 20 straight fights. They, like, they should take their license away. Yeah. I'm like, well, you kind of don't really understand how it works over here no. because it's a different culture because they don't really have a journeyman culture over there. No, no, they don't know. No, they don't know. Look, so, and it's like Buck Smith and Reggie Strickland. Bruce the, Bruce the Mouse. Yeah, Strauss, you know, yeah. They're, they're fighting one state one night and drive down their own fight, but they're only fighting, they're not even fighting boxers. They're not even, I, I would local call, tough man. Local tough man, yeah, I mean, they're just... Fake IDs yeah, and all the rest of it. Yeah, throw a pair of gloves on them because they've had a few fights in the bar the night before, but like... They don't understand that our journey, our journey, man, they'd go over there and probably beat some of their good fighters, do you know what I mean? That's the way I look at it. Yeah, I mean, that whole thing when they say, oh, you should take your license away after 10 fights. No, nah, because, like, one, it's... Oh, who, it who after the, 10 losses. Who's so. them 10 fight, fighters you box? All the 10 fighters are crap, 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 yeah? But if you go back to the kids, 10 of those, 10 of those, 5 of those, 6 of those, and you've been competitive in all them fights, why should you take your license off? If you've been getting knocked out in one of them fights, then probably, yeah, 
because you're not up for the job. But if you've gone the distance for all them kids, like they mean just gone the distance, give them an argument in each round of them fights, why should you? If it would have been the other way around, if you would have been matched against a lesser kid, you'd be getting the win. And if you was on the home show in the home court, you might have had them wins, but, you know, I don't know, they don't understand what Chaneman is over there. Who hit you the hardest? Jim McKenzie. Yeah. <laughs> really did, yeah, a lot of people. Because he hit me with a job, I always say, like, I say, I remember, he hit me with a job and I was like, fuck it, I've never been hit that hard. And he hit me, like, I literally saw it. He was like, like, I always say, like someone poking a broom in my face, with a bang, a broom handle. And Freitas hit hard as well, you know. But um, Paul, Paul Lloyd was a sharp puncher. He was better than his record punching was. He was a sharp puncher. Have you ever felt it hard to deal with the negative comments about being a journeyman? Or is it water off a duck's back? It can be water off a duck's back, but like I say, um, I remember once, yeah, I'm talking years ago when I was boxing, and um, I boxed Vince Sweeney one night in down London, eight threes, took the fight days, I think even on the afternoon, and it was on Sky or Eurosports and that. And uh, I've gone in the pub the next day, and there's a fucking bunch of idiots in there. And the one kid's going, oh, he was on the telly last night, and I was like, yeah, he went, I could have beat that kid. And I went, why was you a boxer? I could have beat that kid. I said, oh, could you? So I fucking banged him out. The, I'll give him the <laughs> you know, I mean? Don't try and make out you a boxer. Like, you, know, I thought, you know, that type of... Like, it's like me watching the football. I could have fucking scored that goal. Yeah. I could have scored the goal because I'm crap at football. So don't... You know, I said to him, well, was you, you, you a boxer by any chance? Like, you done boxing? No. So don't fucking insult my intelligence, mate. Do you know what I mean? You, Vince Freddy, you weren't a bad kid. I were not. But like, don't make out. You could have done what I've done. I've done eight threes, mate. Uh, 24 minutes in the ring fighting. They don't understand it. It's like, anyone can sit and watch. I mean, like, you get, I even get it now. I watch the boxing. I think, fucking hell, man. They should have done this and that. But I'm a boxer. But like, when it's good to the seventh and eighth round, it's fucking tiring work, man. You know, it's hard work, man. People don't realise they fit you got the back. I mean, yeah. you also mentioned at the start there, you talked about booze and fags. Have you smoked all the way through your career? No, no, no. Um, I, I didn't used to read, I, I like a drink now, but I used to have a drink. I was young, man, when I was still boxing. And like, looks like I'd been in prison for so many years. I was still partying and that. And I used to like great, but I used to train that. And I, I never used to really smoke then, but now I was in my career, I used to have the old fag when I used to wear that. But like, I smoke now. What, well, you'd smoke in the dressing room and just... No, 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 I don't smoke. I'd on great, the way to a fight or afterwards or whatever. Uh, so I'd weigh in and they said you're on six or three. If I was at York, I'd pop out the back and have a fag, do you know what I mean? But, in your boxing gear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad <laughs> but, I'm not, no, not glad I'm not glad Hold this. But you never, this you never saw me puffing and out of breath because like I say, uh, even though I used to run every single day, I've always been... Oh, you're uh, so conditioned to doing it. Uh, I was... That's what I mean. I got, when I was a kid, I mean, I used to play rugby. I used to play, you know, I was in the athletics team. I've always been a good runner and I've always had good lungs on me, do you know what I mean? So I've always been pretty, I've always been fit. I mean, even at work now, people say, <laughs> say to me, fucking hell, slow down, man. Because I'm, I'm not 100 mile now, I don't, I don't stop. I'm like, they say to me, I can't fucking believe you're 52 or something. Because I, I, I literally, can, can, I leave the young kids fucking standing because I've always been naturally fit, do you know what I mean, since I was a kid. What do you miss the most? About the boxing, um, I miss going to the gym and the, especially the gym I was in. Because like, we we done a lot of things together. We was like we was mates, we comrades. You know what I mean? Like we all looked out for each other, and we was all in the same situation. We was all at our backs against the wall. That when it comes to a fight, we was all referring at the deep end and very rare. Like you know, we had the middle and top fight. Then it was even Stephen because like look, so I won my middle and top fights and uh, but I do miss the. Uh, the lads and that of the gym and that we, I used to have a good time. I used to look forward to going to the gym. You know, it was never a, a dread going there. I used to, I used to like going. I used to go to the gym not three times a week, and you know, we used to have good banter over there and go to the shows. We used to have a good laugh and that. Do you miss the phone calls? Uh, <laughs> yeah and no. I mean, like I say, I knew it was time to pack it in. I, I knew it was time. Like when I had about like say two hundred and ninety, but like about two hundred and fifty, I was like, I was like, I think fucking hell. I think. Like, I could see the end of the tunnel coming, you know what I mean? God, I don't even know how you get through that. If you're thinking that the end is nigh and you've still got another 50 to go, that's just. But it's not when I had 100 fight. I mean, my 100 fight was a late notice fight. I boxed Mike Devaney, who was former British champion up Scotland. That is notice. And people said to me, You're going to retire now? I said, Fucking job, I'm just starting, I'm just getting warmed up. I was just feel like I was just getting into it then, do you know what I mean? And 
it, it's a mad thing to say, but I, I just I did look, just love fighting. I just love competing in the ring and just love. What about show. like walking through uh, the curtain and the buzz? Do you yeah. miss that? Yeah, I miss that. I used to love that. The, especially if it was, I mean, like I said, I was, I, my, I think it was my two hundred fight. I boxed Baz Carey. Shouldn't have had the fight. My brother had died the week before, and um, it was my two hundred fight, and I wasn't going to go through with it. Ernie Fossey found me up and he said, Pete, I understand if you don't want to, I'm going to look after you. And he did look after me. I sent a limousine to come and pick me up. My mates come with me, drove me to Manchester, waited for me. I thought, and Jimmy Lennon Jr. introduced me just before the Hatton fight. But I was there in body, but not in mine because I was upset about my brother yeah. and I was trying to fight. But I did miss out a lot. I, I did miss, like, you know, the intro, intro introduction and yeah. the lights and the music, you know. I mean, they used to say to me, what music you want, and I'll be used to say, but fucking singing in the rain or something. No, 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 but uh, I was never bothered about that, but I did used to like, I used to like fighting for the big crowd. I used to like it. Yeah. Well, when Brian Nielsen came out to fight Mike Tyson in the park and he came out to the bright side of life. I did, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a Nobby Nobs yeah, yeah, movie, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in terms of boxing now, are you still in touch? You mentioned Nobby. Are you in touch with any of the lads now? Um... No, not look so. They all live a different part of the city, and they're all in the other side of the city. But I speak to Brian Coleman on Facebook now and again. Okay. And uh, Tony Anning used to be like, Cole Taylor, a little message now and again. I saw Cole a couple of years ago. He, he come down because he knew a mate of mine. We had a drink down in the pub down there, a couple of years before the COVID and that. And cause I've all, me and Cole boxed as amateurs together, you see, so I knew Cole. Before. Sure. And, um, but no, look so. I've got four grandsons, and... Uh, Dogs when they ain't working, I spend a lot of time with them and that. And a lot of people have asked me, do I want to go back into coaching and things like that? But I haven't got the time because I, I feel selfish to my grandkids because what time I have, I like to spend with them. I wouldn't want to spend it with other people. So we've got that much knowledge. And someone messaged me not long ago. Look, so when I first finished back, so I was still involved in it for a bit. Look, Sid Razak and Ferrari, uh, yeah. Johnson, that. But then when my mum become ill and that, I was. Uh, Boxing just took a back burner for me then. It was like family's more important to me and that. And, you know. When you got to 300, obviously you said at 250 you started to see the end was in sight. Yeah. Was there a sense of relief? Like, yeah, it's done now. I don't even have... I'm, I, yeah, I'm no longer Peter Buckley, the fighter, the journeyman. The new life can begin. Yeah, and no, because... I knew it was... I, look, so I not many fighters could say, well, I'm going to quit on this night. Blah, 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 I'm never boxing again. But I had that luxury of doing that. But the next day when I woke up, it was like, what the fuck am I going to do now? What am I going to do next week? Because I was that used to the phone ringing. I was like, man, the phone ain't going to be ringing next week saying, do you want to fight in uh, Scotland? Do you want to fight in Dublin? Do you want to fight? I knew that and that was just finished. So that's why I think still being involved with the box, like taking Sid Ray into that. Because Sid, Sid Razak, he, he had my mentality, you see. He like, he'd phone me up and say, Pete, I mean, he pulled up one day outside here when I was training and said that. On the stack they have to be the oil. What? Pete, I've got a fight in Edinburgh. Right, come on, get your stuff. So I fucking I've jumped his car, drove him all the way to Edinburgh. He's boxed the condition was he was on first. He's boxed and drove all the way back. But that's what I loved about Sid, because he was fearless, he'd fight anybody and he didn't give a fuck, do you know what I mean? Also, you were like the um I don't know best you were the you were the most iconic journeyman of the period. Yeah. Probably the most iconic we've had we've had in this country. Yeah. So you then, you, you at the same time, what I'm getting at is you lost your identity because you're no yeah. longer Peter, Peter Buckley, the journeyman. That's right, yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, I'm exactly that. Yeah. Was that hard to surrender? Um, it was a bit, yeah, to be honest, because then you had people like saying, not that uh, Christian, like, loads of respect for Christian. People say to me, Christian's going to beat your record. I was like, it's not my record. It's If he can beat it, fair play to him. And I actually went in to Christian, I went... Walked to the ring or walked through his last fight. Did you? People, for yeah, his 300, yeah. yeah, for his 300. Because like, I was chuffing because he was a real nice kid. And to me, he didn't box the caliber of people I boxed, and done, but he still done 300 fights and he was always in good nick and he was a nice kid. So I was proud to go and walk the ring with him his last fight. You know what I mean? I was honored that he, they asked me to do it. You know, I, I wouldn't have snubbed him. <laughs> they know it's cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have dared snubbed him, do you know what I mean? Because I would have thought that would have been a real insult to, to him, do you know what I mean? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have lowered myself like that. If he would have beat my record, fair props to him, because like, I don't know in that record, someone could beat it, you know, you don't know. 
That's yeah. astonishing. Six hundred fights between the two of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mental. How 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 proud of you are now you've got your story in black and white and you've got it in the book? I am proud, because I am a few people over the years asked me to do a book and let's just talk and this and that. And then there's that book we marked earlier, The Journeyman. Yeah, he, he asked me to do a chapter in it and I, I declined and he asked me again and I was telling him, why don't you do it? I went, because I think I'm more than a chapter in a book. You know, and I actually said so, I said I'm more than a chapter in a book and it got it hit home to me then. I thought, yeah, I'm more than a chapter in a book. Even though I've been in Sweet Fighting Man with Melanie Lloyd a few years ago, Melanie, mother to bitch, you know what I mean? Brilliant writer, and uh, like I said, I met Mel one day, years when I was still boxing. She approached me at a show and she said to me she'd love to put me in the book and do a chapter of that. And she met me in Birmingham City Centre, me and her had a few points, and, <laughs> and she was fucking brilliant. She is, and uh, when she wrote it, I was chuffed. And then, like I said, I was a chapter in her book, but I thought if I'm going to do, you know, I'd only be a chapter in a journeyman book. Um, and Matthew Macklin. I done a podcast with him. I, he found me one day and said, "Pete, can you do a podcast?" There's a pub just down the road, this Irish pub. His friends are only, and uh, he's got a said, "Well, I'm at work, Matt." If I'm, he said, "Well, if you can," and I, I'd finish work and I found me at meet me. I was chatting and blah blah and having a good crack of that. And he's gone to be, a, you know, because he was the king of the journeyman. I went, "Oh," and he went, "He was king of the journeyman." I was like, "Of course, you fucking was." So when he comes to do a book, and the author said to me, "What, what name?" I said, "It's got to be king of the journeyman." He went, "Well, that's all." Well, Matthew back then said it when he said it just struck home and I, I thought that was a great thought for him to give me that you know yeah you must have been so proud when the books came through oh I was yeah like saying um, you know I know my mum was alive she'd be really proud and all my family and that who read it and that and, and a lot of people I'm having a lot of messages off a lot of people saying like you know it's very honest account you don't big yourself up to it you know it's like you haven't hidden on the truths about like you growing up as you know you was in trouble you ain't quite to you know Coach, that you wasn't that kind of kid. I was, I was a bit of a bastard. Yeah. Bit, I worked so well, I was a little, I was a little bastard when I was growing up. And, well, I'm growing out of it. And like, if I wouldn't have gone to boxing, I'll I say, boxing did save me. I know people say it's an old cliche, boxing 100% saved me because if I wouldn't, Brocky Lawler wouldn't have knocked my door that Monday afternoon and took me boxing. What would I have been doing Monday night? Probably out robbing, I don't know. Whatever the missus told you well, to do. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. But look, I was young then still, I yeah. had no kids and like, you know, I only got one daughter, but I've got one daughter, she's first, she's probably got four grandsons, what I think the world of, and, you know, look, I always think if he wouldn't have knocked my door, what, where would I have been, what, would I have gone left, would I have gone right, and... But probably not good. Probably Even, not, whether it was left or right, probably not a good probably choice. Probably not good, yeah, but look, so, I don't know, all right, Ian. It's, yeah, it's funny, because when people talk about boxing success stories, they think of... Uh, they think of the two extremes, don't they? They think of people starting off with nothing and then winding up with everything, yeah, mansions yeah, and all the rest of it. But boxing saves so many more people. Yeah, it's more than that. Yeah. You know, it, it saves amateur kids. Yeah, yeah. It gives them a better life. Of course it does, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, it gives them structure, discipline, routine. Because everyone can't be a champion. Confidence. Right? If you can just confident, like say, look, look, my oldest grandson, he, he doesn't do boxing, he does taekwondo, that's his choice. I wouldn't say to him, you're doing boxing. If he went into boxing, I'd be 100% behind him. If he wants to do taekwondo, and he's been doing it for two years now. It's good, right? That's what he does, drop him there, take it. I used to take him there, but can't win there now. But, you know, he, he loves doing that. And whatever all my grandkids want to do, I'd be 100% behind them. Football, darts, cricket, whatever they want to do. I'm not saying they have to do boxing, you know. A lot, you know, I'll, I'll take them on the, you know, the hands and that, and that, just to show them how to punch and that. But um, whatever they want to do, I'd be 100% behind them. Hypothetical. If someone asks, and you, you've obviously said that people have asked you to train people, if, if, would you train a journeyman or would you train a contender? I'd, both would both look say who's trying to see Razak, he was a journeyman, he was take Kevin McCall. Sure, but I was just wondering if there was one that you preferred the look well, of, you know, if a if a, if a good contender came to you and said, Look, I need to work on my defence and um, get through fights or, or whatever, or would you be more interested in slipping back into the, the culture that you've been in for the last thirty odd um, years? No, look say my nephew used to box, he was very good and um he only did it until he was sixteen, but he had about six fights, he won them all got to the semi-finals of uh, the ABCs or juniors. And I was involved in this amateur club, but I didn't have a trainer's life, but I was training all the kids down there and that. <clears throat> and um, he lost to a kid from Leeds, in Leeds. And after that, I'd, I'd left the club for some reasons. And uh, he kept saying to me, oh, I want to get involved in back in the box. I want to get... I said, well, you got to do it off your own back. You know, I used, to, I used to get a bus from here to the other side of the city when I was 12, 13. You know, you gotta wanna do you, you got if you wanna do it bad enough, you're gonna do it. Yeah. So if you want to do it bad enough, you do it 
but he, he could have been a good kid, but I couldn't actually be there to show him how to do it all the time. You've got to, you've got to want to do it yourself, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, Kid Galahad tells the story. He, he, I think he had a, a two, if not three, bus journey to yeah. get to the Ingle Gym through Sheffield. Yeah, that's what it was like me. Like, you know, I, used to have to get to, I used to have to get a bus all the way up to Lady with the other side of the city, a good you know, five miles away, and I have to walk in the bus about a mile, which was a real rough area in Lady Woods, well, it's still is now, but back when I was younger. I used to go up there on my own, or with my mate who used to box from as well, but if he didn't go, I'd go on my own. I just I just love boxing, yeah, that's what we do. Funny, isn't it? you talk about the hardship of taking a bus five miles and walking a mile, but wouldn't wouldn't blink an eye at getting in the car and doing 200 miles, and nah, having yeah. a scrap and getting back in the car and going nah, back? Yeah, yeah, no, nah, nah, didn't bother me. Like I said, I used to drive anywhere or jump on the train, plane. Train planes and automobiles, basically. You know I mean? No, that's brilliant. But well, thank you so much for your time. I'm really pleased we've managed to get it done. Recommend anyone to take take a look at the book. And I'm really pleased for you that you got one out. I'm pleased that you got your own and Cheers. and all the rest of it, mate. Congratulations awesome. and thank you very much for having us. Thanks. Thank Cheers. you very much, Thanks. King Cheers. of the Journeyman. Thanks, Cheers, mate. mate.